All right, if you open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. And while you're turning there, I'm going to uh, read one scripture out of chapter 4 of Hebrews. And it's actually verses 12 and 13. And it says, For the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing of the soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So his word is sharper than a double-edged sword. So as we begin to open the book of Hebrews up in chapter 12, I just want to pray again. Lord, we just thank you for your word. That it is active, that it is sharp, that it pierces between the spirit and the soul. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would bless the reading of your word. That as we bring it before you, Lord, your word says that your word would not return void. That it would accomplish what it's sent out to do. So, Lord, we just receive what you have for us this morning. I ask for your clarity, for wisdom. Uh, Lord, again, just to be able to articulate your heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, by the way, uh, Bill and I will be going to uh, Texarkana in the morning. I think we have a 6 o'clock flight. Uh, Church on the Rock conference uh, is being held there, so we'll be gone Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, but it's interesting that their whole theme of, of, uh, of this conference is about revival. So we're excited about that. All right, verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore, you know, you, you often see theologians will say, anytime you see therefore in the verse, you need to find out what the therefore is there for. So the therefore is, is going back to chapter 11, which is uh, what we would call the, uh, the faith chapter. It's the, uh, the, also listed in there is the hall of faith you know, where it lists all the different heroes of the faith uh, from the Old Testament and, and what they did and how some did some miraculous things. Some were delivered, some were not. Uh, some suffered uh, and were uh, martyred for their faith. But in verse 39 of that last chapter, it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So what he's talking about, all these other saints who were under the, the old covenant were not able to enter in to the things and the advantages that we as the new covenant believer have. And I always, when I think of that, I always think of, you don't have to turn there, but, but Matthew eleven eleven. 11 uh, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So if you think about that, John the Baptist, one of the greatest prophets, said no man born of woman was greater. And, but then it says, but he who is least in the kingdom of God in other words, John lived during the time of the Old Covenant. He lived and died under the Old Covenant. And so he was preparing the way for something that had not yet arrived. And so it's because of, of, of that advantage that we have, the mercy, the goodness that we have received, that we continue on in verse 1. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So let's stop there. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Now, I'm reading out of the NIV today. 
if you take it out of the uh, new, new American Standard, it says everything that uh, all the encumbrances. The ESV, English Standard Version, uses the word weight. So there's a difference between the encumbrances, the things that hinders, and the sins. Sins are pretty obvious. So what the hard part is, is identifying those things in your life that are encumbrances, things that hinder you. They're not sin. There's not things that, that uh, anybody could point out, but they hinder your walk with the Lord. In other words, they may take time, effort. Uh, you know, we're told to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There are things that keep us from seeking first the kingdom of God. There's other priorities that we have placed ahead of the Lord. And so those are things that are, that are encumbrances. And again, no one can point the finger at you and say, well, you know, you shouldn't do this or that. That has to come from you. You have to come to that place of realization that, you know, maybe it's this hobby, maybe it's the uh, way I spend my time. I need to change something. Because it is hindering me. It's not a sinful thing, but it is hindering me from my walk with the Lord and seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it goes on to say, and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, some versions use the thing about besetting sins. In other words, sins that, uh, that we struggle with, that maybe you struggle with, but your neighbor doesn't struggle with. But there are sins, and usually those things are, are fairly obvious, obvious. And it goes on and says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So let us run with perseverance. Some versions will use endurance. In other words, this race that we're in, it, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And so we need perseverance we need endurance to walk this thing out, to run. Now, regarding the sins part about sin, and again, you don't need to turn there, but I'm going to turn quickly over to First John. Because many times, many theologians will say, First John uh, 2, verse 16, it says, for, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man the lust of the eyes and the boast, boasting of what he has done comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So they will say, usually in these three categories, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, that you can kind of put all sins in one of those categories, that they all kind of fall in that. And so we all battle, again, those besetting sins, those things that, that war against our spirit and against our soul. And it says again, to run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Now that race, uh, we all have a lot of common things regarding that race. But there's also unique things in your life that are different from my life. Different callings, different circumstances, different situations. But we're all supposed to be running in a race. And Paul, uh, we don't know who the re uh, writer of Hebrews is for sure. Some, many think it's Paul, some think it's Apollos, different ones. But Paul does use that analogy of running a race several times throughout the Scriptures. And he sees that as, as it's like an athletic competition competition. In fact, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I want to look at one of those examples. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 24 through 27. And by the way, as he's given this uh, analogy of a race, uh, this is in Corinth, obviously. Uh, it had the second largest games, like the Olympic Games. There was the Olympic Games in Greece, and there was also the games that they had in Corinth, which is the second largest. 
But he says, do, not, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. Now they do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Now, he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about rewards, crowns. And he gives the example of, a, you know, in the Olympics at that time, they would, they would give a wreath, you know, crown. And so he's saying, you know, they, they win the race, they get their little wreath, but it doesn't last. What we're running for is, is a crown, a reward that lasts for eternity. And again, it's, it's, it, it comes to a place where shifting our, our focus upon eternity Rather, you know, we're so focused on this life so often, not realizing that this life is a, is a drop in the bucket. You know, you get, the Bible talks about, you know, we're like the grass of the field. We come, we, we're green, we, we blossom. The wind comes, it blows, and we're gone. This life is, is a short time compared, obviously, to eternity. So run the race with perseverance. The race that is set before you. Run in such a way to get a prize, to get the reward. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, just one verse I want to look at, verse 13. Regarding sin, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up against this. So in other words, the sins that we deal with, as it says, you know, there's no temptation that it sees you except it's common to man. And that second part where it says, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I remember times in my life, many years ago, where I had seen that worked out. I came to like a fork in the road, and I could almost tell, and I wasn't living for the Lord at that time at all, I could tell this is the way out. Don't do this. Turn. And like a fool, I kept going down that path. And then I paid the price for that path. So be aware. Of, and, I, and like I said, that happened a couple different times, and it was just clear to me as a bell afterwards that, that at that point, there was a point where he said, here's your way out. Don't go this direction. And again, like a fool, I went that direction. So he, he gives us a way out so we can stand up against it. Now, Galatians 5, as we're kind of on that subject of, of sin, turn over to Galatians, book right after 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look at verses, uh, start in verse 13. It says, You, my brother, were called to be free, but do not, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, 
and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, whose lifestyle is like that. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying, envying each other. So there's a war going on within each of us between the Spirit and between the flesh, our, our old man. So once we are converted, there's still part of that old nature that is in us that we are continu continually fighting against. And the spirit is against the flesh, and the flesh is against the, uh, against the spirit. And so we need to yield to the spirit, to truly be led by the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be there to, to prick your conscience sometimes, to say, you know, again, just like with, with me, you're, you're on the wrong path. Turn around. And that's what basically repentance is. You turn from the direction you're going. But there is a war going on within each one of us. And as that war goes on, as we begin to get more victory over certain sins, then we begin to discover that, that the Lord begins to fine-tune some of these sins that we, we didn't think was even a big deal. Because the Lord is always bringing us to that place of being, becoming holy and pure like Him. So it's a process. We all walk through that. We don't start out up here. We start down low. We begin to walk as we begin to train ourselves, as we begin to discipline ourselves. We begin to give ourselves to the Lord and truly to His Spirit, being led by the Spirit. And yet we know at the same time there is a war, there is a battle going on within each one of us. But we don't yield to the flesh, we yield to the Spirit. Now, in Hebrews chapter 1, just, you know, again, I, as I said before, it said, run with, a, run with perseverance the race that is marked out for you. Now, I want to go to Romans chapter 9. And, and there, there's a reason. It's not that we are earning something from the Lord. Our motivation really has to come from a revelation of what the Lord has done for us. It has to come of a revelation of the mercy of God. Because everyone in here, if we got what we deserve, what we deserve is hell. We don't want what we deserve. We, we're asking for the Lord for His mercy. It's His mercy and His kindness that brings us to repentance. In chapter 9, we're going to start uh, with verse 6. So he's just been talking about God's choices, and he comes and he says, It is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because... They are his descendants. Are they all Abraham's children? On the contrary, it is through Isaac 
that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's child, children, had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So, verse 14, Paul kind of anticipates a question because of what he just said. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Verse 22, What if God, choosing to show, choose his, show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he has also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So as you can see, it's, it's God's mercy on each one of us. God has had mercy on us. And it was not about us. It was not that he looked at us and said, well, I know in the future this guy is going to really be great. He chose us. He, he, he had mercy upon it. And it's because of that mercy and that grace that once we truly understand grace and mercy that we don't deserve it that it's out of that gratitude for what's been done for us, that we serve him, that we live our lives, a holy life, that we do what it says in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and another 12. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers. Again, that therefore is for everything he's been saying up to this point. In view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And again, because of his mercy, his grace that's been extended to us. Let's go back to Hebrews. 
And we'll pick up kind of where we left off. Chapter 12. So we're running this race, and we're all running it. Similar, but each one is different. And it says in verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So we are to look at Jesus, and he was our example. And it says, for the joy set before him. So even though he knew what he's going to be going through, you know, he's going to be hanging on a cross, he was going to be tortured, beaten, and even probably, you know, it says the shame, and the shame was, one of the shame, part of the shame was, you know, they were not crucified with a loincloth, they were crucified naked. And the biggest thing would be that all our sins was placed upon Jesus at the cross on that pure, spotless bride, that Lamb of God that sacrificed for us. And so it tells us to consider him who endured such opposition and not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 4, in, the, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the words of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as, this, as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are an illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the fathers of, of our spirit and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. Now, no, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. So it talks about the discipline of the Lord, and, it's, and it compares it to the disciplines that may we receive from our fathers. Obviously, God is perfect. Our fathers were not, but they did what they thought was best. Some of us did it well. Some of them did not do well at all. In fact, sometimes that's a, a major, major stumbling block with people because they will see, their, they will see God or Heavenly Father in reflection of their earthly father. And if their earthly father was harsh and cruel then it, it becomes many times a barrier between that person and the Lord. But the Lord does discipline us, but it's for our own good. And we should receive that discipline. So many times when we sometimes think it's the enemy who's attacking us, it could also be the Lord trying to get our attention, saying, mm, you ought to turn around. You're going the wrong direction. Get on the path of life. And so we're running a race. 
And again, again, in this battle where it's flesh against the spirit, the old nature against the new nature, it says we are a new creation in Christ. But again, it's a, it's a process of discipleship, of learning what pleases the Lord, giving a heart to the Lord, studying his word, times of prayer, times of openness with the Lord, asking the Lord hard questions, waiting for answers. And when it doesn't seem like you get an answer, you continue to press in, continue with faithfulness. So it's a race. It's, it's, it's a, it ha- we have to have an attitude of, a, of an athlete who does go in strict training, who begins to, as Paul said, I buffet my body. You know, I, I make it my slave. Got to the point where he... He got to the point where he could say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. That's a point we should all be trying to reach. Got a long ways to go, but he got to that place where he could say that. It's no longer I. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about my will. It wasn't what I wanted. It was what the Lord wanted. And one last scripture, 2 Timothy, since we're talking about Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is it, Paul's uh, coming to the end of his life. He's uh, about to be executed, about to become a martyr, and he knows it. He's writing his second letter to Timothy, a, a younger pastor. And he says in verse 6, says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. But again, he said, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I think for each one of us, that should be when we come to that time, which is the end of our lives, that we'll be able to say that that we have fought the good fight, we have kept the faith, we have finished the race that the Lord has set for each one of us. So, Lord, we just thank you that you have marked out a race for us, Lord. And, Lord, we just ask for your help and your grace to empower us, Lord, that we would have perseverance, that we would have endurance, that as we walk And we run towards you, Lord, wholehearted, Lord. And, Lord, in this battle with the encumbrances, those things that hinder, Lord, the battle with those besetting sins, Lord, that you would give us courage, that you would equip us, everything we need, Lord, to walk in victory in those areas of our life, Lord. For there are no longer any areas of our life that we have closed off to you. But, Lord, that we could get to that point where we'd be like Paul, who could say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. So, Lord, help each one of us. You know we're but flesh. But, Lord, you're able, through your grace and your power, to equip us for every good work. So, Lord, I ask that you would just touch lives this morning. And, Lord, those areas, those things when we talked earlier about encumbrances, those things we talked about, those things that hinder us, Lord, that you would just highlight it to that person, whatever it is, whatever area that is, Lord, that we would become aware that this is something that's weighing us down. It's something that is hindering our walk with you, that we'd be able to give that up fully. And seek first the kingdom of God 
and your righteousness. So, Lord, we just thank you for your work within us. Your Holy Spirit is able to do that, Lord. We just say, come, Holy Spirit. Search us. Search us, Lord. Prepare a people. A people, holy, set apart for you, Lord. And, Lord, I ask this morning, if there's anyone, Lord, who needs a touch in their body, Lord, you are the healer. You are the great physician. Lord, we thank you that you have protected this body from, from that COVID virus, from that spreading among any, anyone, Lord. And we continue to pray for that, Lord, that this is a, a COVID-free zone. And, Lord, we look to you as our healer, as our provider, as our all in all. And we give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.